you have to be the one controlling your own money because nobody else is going to do that for you. Everyone else is a toll taker because they make money the more money you spend. So they have no incentive to help you save money or reduce the fraud in your campaigns. Welcome to What Gets Measured, a Ninja Cat podcast about marketing performance management, metrics, and effectiveness. Because what gets measured gets managed. I'm your host, Jake Sanders. Dr. Augustin Fu is an independent ad fraud researcher and founder of Fu Analytics, which helps clients create integrated marketing campaigns and objectively assess their performance. With a PhD in material science and engineering and over two decades of marketing experience, ranging from faculty, expert witness, coach, and upper management, Dr. Fu has passionately dedicated his career to helping marketers increase the productivity and effectiveness of their advertisements. And he's here today. To help us understand and combat ad fraud, Dr. Fu, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jake. Glad to be here. Nice, man. Um, so let's jump in. Let's, let's start with like a, a general eagle-eye view of digital ad fraud. What does it look like? How bad is it? How widespread is it? And how seriously are agencies and clients taking it? That's a lot of questions in one. But uh, I'm so- let, no, no, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me talk about ad fraud in general. So I'm sure everyone's heard of the term, but um, you know, in the good old days, uh, 10 years ago, it was basically about bad guys setting up fake websites and uh, using bot traffic to just juice the numbers so they would get tons and tons of traffic on a site that no humans would have heard about before, right? So uh, they have means, uh, the motive to, is to make money, and the means are to use bot traffic to create the illusion of a lot of traffic. And now with the um, ad exchanges, they can now add tens of thousands of sites into an exchange and start selling ads within the week or something, right? So uh, it's actually technologically uh, made it far easier for the bad guys to scale the fraud. So digital ad fraud at its roots is basically ads shown to bots and not to humans, right? Mm -hmm. And that originally took place on websites. But now we're talking about mobile apps as well. So there's millions upon millions of mobile apps that very few humans have heard about. But yet they're generating hundreds of billions of ad impressions. And all of that's using bot activity and mobile emulators to create the illusion of a lot of users using these mobile apps. So ad fraud can take a variety of uh, different forms. And when you ask about the agencies uh, taking it seriously, I'm going to be super nice today and say, yes, the agencies are taking it seriously, uh, but they've had very limited tools to use. So the current fraud detection tech that they're using to look for the fraud keeps telling them everything is less than 1%, fraud is lower than 1%. It's almost like, don't worry about it. We don't even think it's a problem anymore. So when they have only those tools at their disposal, you can understand why they think everything is fine, and they just keep spending more and more and more money in digital programmatic. But uh, that's why I had to develop my own tools because I didn't trust anyone else's tech and I didn't trust anyone else's data. And I certainly don't trust anyone else's understanding of the problem because they really haven't studied it closely enough. So there's far more fraud than the current uh, crop of technology tends to say there is. So I call my platform Foo Analytics and we use it to kind of audit the campaigns and kind of just get more details so that we could study it. And some of it is because the bots are able to avoid the detection or get around uh, the detection by these other companies. Some of it's because the bots just block the tags. So those technology companies have no data and they can't mark a bot to be invalid. Mm 
So they basically leave it and people just assume it's fine. So the, the moral of the story here is that if you have more details, you can kind of gut check it yourself and say, okay, well, this still doesn't look right. Even though they keep telling me there's no fraud here, it doesn't smell right. It still doesn't smell mm-hmm. right. I'm not getting any sales from it. So hopefully that's the wake up call for agencies so that they understand that, yes, what they're doing is okay, but they can do more, right? They can Mm. look in more detail. They can ask harder questions and that way they can better serve their clients on the topic of ad fraud. Yeah. And, and it really comes down to closing the loop. Like you run a whole bunch of ads and then you look at the sales and say, well, it seems like we're generating a lot of traffic, but we're not making a lot of sales from that traffic. So Fraud's happening, and you know, with I mean, without getting foo analytics, is there a way that marketers can know if what they're what they're seeing is real or not? Yeah, they they don't need to have foo analytics. They can just use their own Google Analytics. But let me let me set the stage by separating two kinds of advertisers. Okay, so there are the the largest of advertisers, which are the big brands like P and G, Unilever, a lot of the automotive brands and financial services. Their primary interest is in branding, and so they're looking for reach and frequency. And so they're going into programmatic to say, okay, we want to buy hundreds of billions of ad impressions. Okay. In those cases, they're not looking for sales, right? They're not directly tying it to did the digital media, did the digital marketing drive sales, right? It's several steps removed, so they're not really looking for that correlation mm-hmm. um, or causation, I should say. So therefore, they are at the most risk for ad fraud because you know when they're asking to buy hundreds of billions of ad impressions the only way to get that large a quantity is through bot activity mm-hmm. okay now the other kind of advertiser is what i'm going to call the more direct to consumer direct response type advertiser and these tend to be the small and medium businesses where they are looking at their sales every single day every single week and when they invest a small amount of money, you know, whether it's $1,000 or $10,000 or whatever in digital media, and they're not getting any kind of return, they're not getting any sales that they can actually see, a sales lift, uh, they can't afford to spend the next $1,000 or $10,000, right? So right. these types of businesses that are hyper-focused on, did we get business outcomes? They are much less at risk of ad fraud because they are looking at the outcomes. And so for a P&G, you know, they don't tend to sell direct to consumer, right? They sell bulk or wholesale to grocery stores or Walmart and whatever. So they don't tend to see the lift in sales at at the point of sale at the end consumer. Mm -hmm. So they're just putting a lot of ads in there hoping that, oh, if we get more reach and frequency, people will be reminded about our brands and therefore they might buy it. But if you recall back in 2018, when P&G turned off $200 million of their digital spend, they didn't see any change in business outcomes, right? The proponents of digital media would just claim, oh, well, it's too too long of a a timeframe, right? We're not gonna see any ripple effects right away and whatever, whatever. but that should be an indication that there's something wrong with the way we're doing digital media right now. Mm, And just obsessed with uh, impressions. Yeah. And so is is there like a fraud-free strategy? I mean, what, you know, strategically, what can marketers do to analyze their campaigns. I mean, I, you know, speaking personally, I looked at my Google Analytics and me and my boss kind of went through just a spike in traffic and we weren't sure because it was there and then it was yeah. gone. And then it, it, it was weird because if you trace it back and look at the referral traffic and see where things are coming from, it, it, it's almost, it's, it's difficult to do those kind of things. Yeah. And the man hours that you'd have to put towards that are, well, okay, so... That was a, I guess, just meaningless traffic, an anomaly or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think you know it's really about that kind of discipline, right? So you know you would go into your Google Analytics and you know kind of trust your gut and look for things that are just out of the ordinary. Okay. So like that spike in traffic, okay? some something would have caused that, right? And uh, then you would kind of isolate that particular uh, point in time. And then just look at things like, you know, what's the bounce rate? What's the time on site, right? If you're seeing a 100% bounce rate, that means those bots hit your page and left right away, right? If a human actually meant to come to your website, they're probably going to do something, right? Look around a little bit, navigate the page or whatever. 
But if 100% of that is 100% bounce, right? 100% bounce rate, something's wrong with that, right? That's not a valuable visitor to your site anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Or if it's like um, zero time on site and all that kind of stuff. So simple things to gut check uh, your Google Analytics would already help to say, you know, what was the cause of that? Now, in your case, you may or may not have been running digital media, but you mm -hmm. can typically see, okay, when I turn on a campaign, so this is what another small business owner told me. When she turned on a Google AdWords, AdWords campaign, she saw a huge spike in Android traffic, right? So all of a sudden, it was like a 100,000% increase in Android visitors to her site. And then she looked at the characteristics like the bounce rate, the time on site and all that, and none of it made sense. So she could very clearly see that that happened when she turned on the campaign. So then she turned it off again, and then it all went away. So she could clearly see that when she started paying for digital media, the traffic that she was getting from it was actually not valuable, right? All these Android visitors that really didn't stick around to do anything. So in that sense, she could prove to herself, okay, you know, whether she could identify the bots or not, she could still tell that that kind of spending in digital media was not going to do anything for her business outcomes. So she mm. just left it off. Right. And then that way you can redeploy your dollars somewhere else. That's going to actually be more effective for you. Well, and so speak about that. Like, I mean, <clears throat> I want to, you know, run ads on, you know, uh, publications that I know my audience might be into. Is there a way I can just go directly to them and not go through a third party or, or like, what's the best way to go about media planning yeah so i think the media planning what, what you mentioned is a, is a good approach typically when you're a small and medium business business owner right you won't be able to approach a hearst or a condé nast and buy ads from them so that's why we have programmatic technology so let me put it this way just to be more clear programmatic technology itself is not bad right it actually has solved a lot of the problems of small businesses being able to access certain types of ads, certain publishers, certain inventory, right? So that's actually a good thing. Programmatic tech is good. However, there are bad guys using programmatic tech to do bad stuff like ad fraud, okay? So for you as a small business owner, if you say, yes, you know your audience goes to peopleonespanol.com, right? Your Hispanic audience goes to that particular site and maybe a handful of others you can actually create what's known as a whitelist or an inclusion list of sites, right? Just put those 10 domains in there, put those 20 domains in there, and uh, you can use programmatic uh, infrastructure to bid on those 10 to 15 or 20 domains. And that's, all, that's where you want your ads to run because you know your audience goes to those types of sites or those specific sites. So that's a much, much better way to run your programmatic campaigns mm. than the way the largest brands do it, because they basically, they don't use an inclusion list. They just buy it everywhere. And that's mm. when we see these crappy apps like flashlight apps, casual games, uh, goat feeding simulator apps. Okay. I don't know how many humans <laughs> play goat feeding simulator apps, but they generate an awful lot of impressions. So those may not be real. Okay. So in that case, you're going to run across millions upon millions of sites and apps and you just can't block all of them so right. i think you know if you're a small business owner the best way to to use programmatic is to use a kind of an inclusion list or whitelist approach so you're only buying on the sites where you think your audience will likely be and speak more to that so uh, and just kind of expand on this now um uh, digital TV ads. Can you kind of explain some of these things? They're like, whoa, we can run ads on Roku. You know, now, you know, is, is now those issues happening over there? Yeah. Or? Ad fraud goes wherever the money is, right? The bad guys will steal from whatever pot of gold you leave unattended. Okay. And, <laughs> and basically, if you look at the numbers, it's $190 billion of digital spending in the U.S. every single year. So they replenish that pot of gold with $190 billion here in the U.S. And globally, they replenish it with $500 billion worth of digital ad spending, right, from all the largest brands. So every year, bad guys get to steal from those unattended pots of gold. Okay, so don't be those advertisers that are buying hundreds of billions of ads. Be the small advertiser that is very uh, 
conscious of where your ad dollars go and where your ads go, right? And use mm-hmm. the kind of the the inclusion list approach. And in doing so, you know, here here's a little thought exercise I like to ask my students or ask my clients. Okay, name off as quickly as you can 10 websites that you go to every single day. Okay, you don't have to do that right now, but just give that a thought. And then do the same with mobile apps. Name 10 mobile apps that you use every single day as fast as you can. Okay, now most people are going to get to five or six or seven, and then they're going to start slowing down. They can't even name 10 mobile apps that they use every single day. Okay. Now these are, keep in mind, these are the ad supported ones, not the Gmails or the, you know, whatever. So in that case, if a human can't name off more than 10 apps uh, that they use every single day, who's using the long tail of apps, right? There's tens of uh, millions of apps out there uh, that run ads. Who's using those? Okay. So common sense will tell you humans use a finite set of websites, mobile apps, and CTV channels, right? So if you think about your own habits, you're going to spend a lot of your time streaming from YouTube and Netflix. Uh, YouTube ads, you can only buy through Google, right? And then Netflix doesn't have ads yet. They will, but they don't have yet ads right now. So most humans stream from those known sources, right? You may throw in ESPN and Hulu and maybe History Channel, A&E, Food Network or whatever. But, you know, beyond 20, of those uh, ch- streaming channels, who the heck are using all these long tail Roku apps for streaming, right? When was the last time you actually downloaded a whole bunch of different Roku apps onto your TV or Roku stick and then spent a whole ton of time streaming on those niche apps? Right? Well, so Most humans it, don't do that. So, well, and, and so I'm going to just come back and say, you know, I, I, you think that in the long tail, you stand a better chance of getting some some traffic it's like in the niches there yeah. are riches everyone yeah. says this but but you're outlining like kind of like just a common sense argument be like who's literally going to these places and i i think that at once it seems a little bit it it seems confusing because uh, you know when when i'm running a campaign i'm like oh cool we got a whole bunch of small little traffic from these small little sites and Yeah. So I would definitely recommend cherry pick those, right? So you know your audience. There might be 10 long tail sites where your audience does go for very niche content. But think about this. Because they are long tail, the numbers are going to be super tiny. So Mm -hmm. if you're getting more than the five or 10 or 15 people who are super passionate about a certain topic, something's wrong with that, right? Long tail sites don't have tens of millions of visitors generating hundreds of millions of page views. Okay, so when you see that kind of stuff, it's not a long tail site. It's actually a fraudulent site buying all the bot traffic. Okay, Mm. so I think the original premise that yes, there is riches in the long tail. Yes, there there are, but you should handpick the long tail sites uh, that you wanna be on. Now I'll translate this into a YouTube advertising strategy. You need to cherry pick the YouTube channels where your ads would be the most relevant. So just literally cherry pick 10, 15, small number. Again, it's like an inclusion list approach, right? Just choose a a select number of YouTube channels where you want your ads to run. Running your ad anywhere else on YouTube means it's going to go to really, really bad places, right? We've seen terrorist beheading videos get mm-hmm. ads we've seen right. you know really just really really bad stuff on youtube that you don't want your ads to show up next to and you're going to get all that because it's ugc it's user generated content and you literally don't know what the heck it is that your ads running next to so mm-hmm. it really speaks to using that inclusion list and whitelist approach where you're cherry picking the you know, list of YouTube channels where you want your ads to run because you know the creators are producing great content. You know, they're very passionate about that particular topic area. And you know, the people who go to those are people who are open to, you know, the thing that you're selling. Right. So you, you mentioned P and G cutting off, you know, 200 million in ad spend and not seeing a change. You mentioned one of your clients, she, uh, discovered the Android spike. Yeah. Um, it, do you have an, uh, another story that you can share about an agency or media company that discovered fraud, beat it, and came out on top? And conversely, do you have 
which I'm pretty sure you do, ho- any horror stories you can share where fraud got the best of a team and yeah. endangered their business? I, I think some of those uh, I can mention are public, right? So in addition to the P&G one, do you remember the Chase uh, example where mm. they reduced their programmatic reach from 400,000 websites showing their ads to just 5,000 websites? So that's a 99% decrease in the number of websites that they were buying in their programmatic media. No change in business outcomes. Okay, so Chase wow. did that. They, they did a drastic re- decrease. It wasn't like a 9% decrease or a 19%. It was a 99% decrease in the number of ads showing, in the number of sites showing their ads, and they saw no change. So like most of those sites running their ads did not do anything for their business outcome. So they were completely useless. It was a waste of money to show ads on those sites. Okay, so they did that experiment. But as you can tell, it's, it's pretty rare that these experiments are run because the marketers themselves, they're given a budget to spend and they want to spend it all, right? So that's why, again, I differentiate the largest of advertisers from more the direct response type advertisers, right? The direct response advertisers are very careful with their money. The large brands, they're looking for branding and awareness and reach and frequency. They're the least careful with their money. And they tend to hand their entire budget to a media agency to spend for them. And the media agencies don't want to, you know, find the fraud because that means there's less stuff to buy. And they have to work harder trying to find the good places to show their ads. Right now, if nobody's complaining, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't rock the boat. Right. That's mm-hmm. why fraud has persisted for so long. Right. Mm-hmm. And so between the PG example, the Chase example, uh, Uber uh, found that 80% of their $150 million of spend were going to fraudulent mobile exchanges. These mobile exchanges were basically claiming credit for app installs that had already occurred. They are falsifying the records, they're falsifying the attribution uh, data to make it appear that they caused the ad, uh, the apps to be installed when they had Mm. nothing to do with it. So they were Mm. in essence ripping off Uber with their eyes open. Okay, so Uber found that they shut it off and the app installs continued because none of it had to do with the digital ads. People just wanted to install the Uber app anyway. That's called organic installs, right? Mm -hmm. So for Uber, uh, they kind of, their own analytics person found that. So they were able to turn that off. So it was a horror story to begin with, but they fixed it. Kevin Frisch, the analytics person, looked at it and said, okay, let's turn it off for a week. Let's see what happens. Nothing happened. The app installs continued. So he said, let's leave it off for another week. Nothing happened. The app installs continued. So then he said, let's cut all of it. And then that's how... He discovered it himself. Note that none of the agencies that were serving them, none of the fraud detection tech companies that were serving them, none of the exchanges that were serving them told them about the fraud because Mm -hmm. the exchanges themselves were committing the fraud. So now Uber is in the process of suing 100 mobile exchanges, Okay, not five, not 10, not 20, 100 mobile exchanges were all committing fraud, feasting on their dollars. But unfortunately, all of that happened in the 2015, 2016 timeframe. We're in 2022 now. And if this Uber lawsuit finishes and they win, you know, several years from now, most of those mobile exchanges have died and gone away, right? They made off with the money already. There's no getting your money back. So the, the moral of the story here for any advertisers listening, small or big, is you have to be the one controlling your own money because nobody else is going to do that for you. Right. Everyone else is a toll taker because they make money the more money you spend. So they have no incentive to help you save money or reduce the fraud in your campaigns. So you're the only party uh, that has to be responsible for your own budgets. So is is there any instance where ad fraud tanked somebody or do you know of anything like where I a mean, lot I guess- of that? You know, it's not that they completely tanked the company, but they certainly wasted lots and lots of dollars. And where it hurts the most is when it's a small business, right? So I still see cases where small businesses, local businesses, for example, barbershop or a restaurant, you know, they're putting money into digital advertising because everyone else is putting money into digital advertising. But unfortunately, after they spent $1,000 on digital ads, $10,000 on digital ads, they didn't get a single additional person through their doors to eat at their restaurant or go to the bar, go to their barbershop or anything. 
that's where it hurts the most because $10,000 to a small local business owner, to a, to a restaurant is a very, very meaningful chunk of money. Mm-hmm. Whereas P&G can blow the entire $2 billion annual budget and still be in business. They don't care, right? It's $2 billion. So I still see that happening and they may not have put the uh, small business out of business, but it was a tremendous waste of money and it would be, it's just sad to watch, right? When, when, you know, small businesses are losing that kind of money. Well, and speak about strategic approaches to ads themselves. Like, is, is there a way, so you, you, I think a lot of people are obsessed with the technology, the serving, the, you know, the display side, the supply side, kind of understanding the fraud of that. But also people are making whack ads, you know, like if, if you made a really cool ad, you'd maybe get some of those organic things naturally, but people kind of talk themselves into sort of bland advertising. Yeah, and, and they, that and they get rolls. caught up in the shiny object syndrome, right? They, they think, right. oh, this is cool, magical tech and all that kind of stuff. And pretty much it isn't. Okay, so if it's so cool and all that, it's, it's, you, your gut should tell you it's more snake oil than, than real ads. Okay, so right. let me take a t- step back and say, you know, I've been a small business owner for the most part of t- the last 25 years. And the, I run campaigns myself. So if I were to give advice to another small business owner, it would be keep things simple. And mm-hmm. start with something that is not paid media. Start with content creation. Okay, so the logic behind that is very simple. If you run ads and you get people to your site and then there's no content there, there's nothing of value on your site, they're going to get there, be disappointed, and then never consider your business again. Okay, so before you spend any dollar on, on paid media, make sure you have adequate content. That's not to say you have to have a lot of content. That just means you have to have at least some content. So whether that's on your website, on your Facebook page, or wherever you're driving the traffic to, you have to have something of value there so that when you drive a new prospective customer there, they're getting some value out of it, right? Otherwise they're going to leave and be pissed at you and never come back. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like, if you have a dollar, it's better to invest it in content because that content can continue to pay dividends for you over time. Whereas a dollar spent in paid ads, think of it as a TV ad, a print ad, or a digital display ad, the ad is over the moment it is displayed. So then you don't get any further uh, benefit from it, right? You know, the second after the, the ad is aired. So again, think about investing your dollars. And some of these, especially for small businesses, it's harder in dollars. So invest in content, and then when you need to drive more awareness, then there are certain things that you can do in paid. Okay, so I would use display ads on Facebook. Make sure you turn off FAN, Facebook Audience Network. Know that you're going to get very small quantities, and that's actually a good thing because when you're getting super large quantities, 99% of that is ads shown to bots, and 99% of the clicks are fake anyway. So getting all that quantity doesn't do anything for your business outcomes. Okay, so mm. display ads on Facebook, uh, turn off FAM, search ads on Google, turn off search partners. So you make sure all your ads show on uh, Google itself. You, if, you, if you want to do video ads, do YouTube, but hand pick the channels, right? Don't leave it open so your ads go everywhere. Just hand pick the channels that, that are relevant to you. And if you're doing those kind of things, you've covered the majority of the ways of reaching perspective human audiences and you've avoided the vast majority of the fraud so like you were saying before you don't need specialized tech you don't need full analytics you don't need any other fraud detection just use common sense and always keep an eye on your outcomes and then do more of what's working and do less of what's not simple as that Oh, yeah. Well, it, but I, I love the outcomes outputs because I think a lot of uh, we love those big numbers. Yeah. And when you get into digital advertising, you you realize that you should be celebrating smaller click through yes. rates. Yes. Like They're, that are like, more realistic. Right. I think a lot yeah, of the big yeah. advertisers, they're now so addicted to and accustomed to big numbers that going back to reality seems strange to them. Right. They're mm. saying, why am I not getting a 10 percent click through rate? Uh, because all of that is not humans. Right. So I just put up a recent blog post that says 90 to 99% of the clicks are from bots. 
I, I can only see between one and 4% of the clicks in various programmatic campaigns to be humans. Now, if you're only looking at clicks and counting the quantity of that, um, then you might say, oh, wow, these campaigns are performing so well because I'm getting so much, so many clicks. But, you know, clicks don't mean business. They don't mean more sales, more outcomes, more people walking into your restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. So that's been a kind of vanity metric, a quantity metric that's been easy to report. And therefore, everyone reports on that. But marketers need to be smarter than that. Those quantity metrics that don't translate into actual outcomes should not mean anything to you. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave them with a question. Are you doing digital marketing or are you playing video games? Because playing video games, you want a higher score, right? Larger numbers are better. So if you want larger numbers in your Excel spreadsheets that your agency gives back to you or in the dashboard that show, wow, we got so many impressions, we got so many clicks, larger numbers. Are you doing digital marketing to drive real outcomes and sales? Or are you playing a video game? Mm -hmm. If you're playing a video game, that's fine. It's your money. But I'm here to help those marketers who are actually interested in doing digital marketing and actually driving real business outcomes. Oh man. All right, cool. So you, you, you gave us some really, really <clears throat> solid advice on how we can approach this. But if you had to distill all of this into like a bumper sticker, what, what's your one piece of advice to the audience about fraud and how they can move forward with confidence? I would say don't be afraid of ad fraud. Um, as a small business owner, as long as you're focused on sales and outcomes, you should be able to avoid most of the fraud anyway. Just make sure you're not looking for large numbers, high click-through rates, and things like that. Um, humans don't click on ads that much. Say that one more time. Humans don't click on ads that much. Then say it again. Humans don't click on ads that much. So even if you see small click-through rates, um, that's not a bad thing. And as long as you're seeing actual outcomes, from your digital marketing efforts, then keep doing that. And like I said earlier, do more of what's working and quickly kill the stuff that's not working. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money, right? Ooh. So you have to do it yourself. Trust your gut. Um, look at the analytics yourself. If you don't have time to do that and you farm that out to somebody else, if you outsource that to an agency, then you might as well not do it at all. Because for the most part, what I've seen are the large agencies really are there to just spend your money because once they spend your money, they get to earn their fees and commissions and whatever, whatever. They're not there for the most part to help you drive better business outcomes. I will say the smaller agencies are doing a much better job of that, but the largest agencies that serve the largest brands, they're all doing a crappy job. Okay, so overall, uh, you know, we're talking to the marketers here, whether you're a large marketer or small marketer, you need to spend the time to look at the analytics, look at the data yourself. You don't need any specialized tools. You just need common sense. And then you'll mm -hmm. still be able to do better digital marketing than you are doing right now. Oh boy. So people have heard you. They now know that you're passionate about getting results. Um, it's not all about calling people out or canceling someone. Yeah. You know, and you have technology that you built with your experience. If people want to connect with you online and, and get a taste of Foo Analytics, how can, where can they find you and learn yeah, more about so you? So they can come to fooanalytics.com. So F-O-U analytics with an S dot com. Uh, they can request an invite and then just tell me what they want to measure. I'm happy to, to give them an account and a tag. And Foo Analytics is free for small and medium businesses. Anyone's welcome to use that so that they have additional analytics to look at, right? Just like they use GA, Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics on their website, Foo Analytics is analytics for their digital media. So whatever they're doing in uh, digital media, like display ads, video ads, uh, things like that, they can measure that with Foo Analytics and it's free to them. The reason I can offer it for free is, you know, 15 years ago when I started out, um, you know, GA was free. That was the only thing I could afford, right? So I use that to look at my own website. So most people can use this for free, analyze their own websites and their digital media. Um, I can afford to do that because I'm an independent researcher. And for some of the largest of advertisers, they do an annual subscription because they're running tens of billions of ad impressions. So they do have to pay something for that. But that allows me to keep the infrastructure up so anyone else can, you know, small businesses with relatively low traffic websites can actually use that for free. 
so they can uh, use Food Analytics. They can also see some of my articles. Just Google my name or go to LinkedIn and search my name, Augustin Fu. Uh, they'll see all the articles and data uh, that I've published over the last 10 years on this topic. Cheese or chocolate? Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Uh, cheese or chocolate? Uh, chocolate. Fine dining or greasy spoon? Fine dining. Cost per mill or cost per meal? Um, cost per mill. David Bowie or David Byrne? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an not answer. An option? Okay. Come on, um, Augustine. Pick one. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know who David Byrne is. <gasps> well, then I you should mean... have checked you out. The talking heads, dude. Okay, uh, I know David Blaine is a magician guy, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm not into Bowie either, so. That's so David I Blaine is your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, no one expected that. That's amazing. Okay, okay keep okay. going. Periodic table of elements or pivot table of analytics? Uh, periodic table of elements, because I'm a chemist by training. My PhD was in chemical engineering. Nice, man. All right, and finally... Magic cauldron or magic carpet? Magic cauldron, because I'm a chemist and I make magic in the cauldron. What Gets Measured is a Ninja Cat podcast. Please rate and review the show wherever you find your podcasts. Share this episode on social and visit us on the web at ninjacat.com. Dot I owe.